long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your radio host, Scott Daly, and even a blind man can see that my co-host is King Newbie, Matt Freeman. How's it going this week, Matt? Oh, it's going pretty well. Just sitting here listening to the radio, listening to all this horrible, horrible shit happening out there in, <laughs> in, in the small town that I live in. The small Wisconsin town where nothing bad happens except everything. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's right, because this week on the show, we are officially beginning our coverage of Stephen King and Peter Straub's follow up novel to the talisman. We're doing Black House, Matt. We're here. It's the first episode. It's a new book episode. It's a new month. It's very exciting. It, it is. It's, it's always exciting to start a new book. Mm hmm. Today on the uh, show, we will be covering the first two chapters of Black House, the first 50 pages or so. And, uh, oh, it's going to be a, a big, a big old stuffed episode, Matt, because there's a lot to talk about in these in these m- measly 50 pages. That's true. That's true. Uh, we, we, we're acclimating ourselves to a really rather different environment than what I expected to be. Yeah, we'll talk all about that for sure. But uh, that's one of the things I was most curious about going into this book with you is is the the jolt from one book to another. Mm hmm. But before we get into that, we do have a couple quick announcements. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone (laughs) um, who sent in all your suggestions for what books we should cover uh, if we do a season three. I'm still saying if there. Um, I think, you know, it it was funny because like I had a in my head a pretty good idea of what books I would want to do. I think I've even told you the books already, Matt. And and I did see a lot of people saying those books that I had in mind, which was kind of validating in a way. But then there were all these other suggestions that were like, oh, damn, that's a good idea. Mm. How could I not include? Oh, and it just like it was it was a lot. Uh, a lot of you folks reached out. We have so many suggestions. Um, definitely going to have a lot of contemplating to do here. Uh, so we'll figure it out. Interesting. Yeah, you haven't really tipped your hand to to tell me what books have been suggested yet. So I'm now no. I'm kind of curious, actually. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, you can go in the Reddit thread and see. But we also got uh, a a shit ton of emails from people too. So okay, uh, it's very exciting. I appreciate you all taking the time to shoot those emails out to us. Um, and and most of you also like were really nice to us. We were like, here's my suggestions for season three. Also, I love you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, thank Aww. you, yeah. thank you. How sweet. Matt, what is the other announcement we have this week? Um, we, uh, Scott and I, that is, went on uh, the Losers Club. I, I believe it's their Patreon bonus podcast uh, feed. Yeah. Uh, they, they are another Stephen King podcast, if you haven't heard of the Losers Club. Um, we've been on their show before. Um, they're, they're really nice dudes. And uh, uh, we had a really great time with them. Yeah, they have this uh, Patreon show called the dark tower detour um which is just talking about random crap random detailed crap in the dark tower universe so of course they they call us up uh for for help with that uh because we're the weird dark tower people um i think last time we talked about the comic books but this time they wanted just to talk about dark tower animals which i have to be honest with you matt when they reached out to us this with this topic i was like huh oh okay (laughs) what (laughs) i guess we could do that Uh, but 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 it actually turned out to be a pretty great conversation i think yeah there 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 are way more uh animals in the dark tower than i thought and way more uh, plot important animals than i thought yeah we ranked our top 19 (laughs) favorite (laughs) dark tower animals uh although like we didn't i mean ranking is a loose term we just talked about 19 dark tower animal things yeah yeah and it was yeah it was a great conversation it was a lot of fun those guys are great um unfortunately like we said it's a a patreon exclusive thing for them so if you are a patron of the losers club you can get to listen i i don't know if it's out yet i think it's gonna be out really soon i don't maybe yeah maybe tomorrow maybe by the time you're listening to this will be out i don't know i haven't seen anything yet but uh it'll be out very very soon and you should be a patron of the losers club and listen to us talk more about the dark tower because you don't get enough of it here yeah, maybe we'll give you some more info uh, when it has actually dropped. Yeah, we'll, for we'll sure. Try to, uh, we'll try to. Once, uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter because once we see that it's dropped, we will definitely let y'all know there. Yep. But uh, yeah, check out the Losers Club. We've talked about them a few times before, but they're pretty great. They actually just did an episode on Black House uh, last week. I have not listened to it because it would just ruin 
everything <laughs> for me in the, the next month or so with this book. So I, I'm going to wait till after we finish it before I go back and listen to theirs. But uh, great, great show. You should listen to it. We love when they have us on and hopefully we'll get to, you know, return the favor here sometime soon. Yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, Matt, let's talk about Black House. So okay. a- as we do at the beginning of any new book, we have to we have to set the stage a little bit here, right? Um, we have to talk about the book overall. So, so Black House is, as we said at the top, the sequel to The Talisman. It is another collaboration between the authors Peter Straub and our Stephen King. Uh, this book was published, as we said last week, on September 15th, 2001, which makes it 17 years removed from The Talisman. I, I do think, you know, along with being almost a, a full adult human uh, distance away from the talisman i think it's important to put this in context of of the dark tower series as well uh so this book comes out two years after stephen king's van accident um and two years before king really starts his marathon sprint to the dark tower finish line remember in 2003 he goes bam 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 with uh wolves uh Song of Susanna and then the Dark Tower itself. So so when we're, we're discussing this book, we have to remember that the wolves, the breakers, Mia and and Psy King being a character in the Dark Tower is still not officially part of the Dark Tower canon yet. Um, but but I think as we'll discuss here in this episode, this book almost immediately declares itself as a novel much more closely linked with the Dark Tower mythos than the than talisman ever did. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, it, it, we we noticed some things. We noticed Dark Tower references immediately, which we'll get into. Obviously, um, you know, I, I I think I think a lot of those ideas related to the Dark Tower stuff that you just mentioned, even if they aren't firmly part of the Dark Tower canon when this book comes out, I think those yeah. ideas are kind of floating around his head um, at, at around this time frame. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some stuff that was strictly speaking um, ahead of its time. If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting because obviously King has this accident in which he almost dies. And then one of the things that comes out of this accident is, oh, my God, I'm mortal and I almost just died and I haven't finished the Dark Tower. So I need to do this right away. And that's why four years later, he finally finishes the Dark Tower in this one one two year long just dump of of words. But I think, you know, we look at Black House, you look at a guy who maybe says, you know, I really enjoyed writing with Peter Straub. I really enjoyed that. And and he and I always talked about doing a sequel, but we never really did it. We never got around to it. And I almost died. And so let me reach out to my friend Peter and be like, hey, Pete, you want to do this thing? I got this idea. You want to do this thing? Let's do a sequel to The Talisman. Let's do it. And so I think this is all part of this post uh, mortality realization for Stephen King that that he he picks up things that he hadn't touched in a long long time. One of those being the Dark Tower, the other being uh, the Talisman and Black House, and of course they're intrinsically connected, as we noticed immediately in the first fifty pages of this book. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, th- definitely, I, I think we can take the Dark Tower and the fact that he finished it so quickly as a kind of bellwether of of what is going on with with him as a human being and and he's you know he he's thinking life is short i i got to actually do this stuff that i that i keep thinking about in the back of my mind and and i think it makes total sense to me that one of the things that he wanted to do or that he had been wanting to do would be do another collaboration with this guy cuz it seems like he enjoyed the first one uh, so yeah that makes total sense yeah yeah and like we said Like with The Talisman, King and and Straub co-wrote this book. And I wanted to briefly talk about that before we get into this book proper, because actually in between us starting The Talisman and and now, we actually got sent an interview that was done uh, with Peter Straub around the time Black House was released. One of our listeners, Becky B, sent that into us. Thank you so much, Becky. And in this interview, Straub outlines in a little bit more detail than I've ever seen the process that these two guys use to actually write this book. So, So that's very useful that we have this information yeah that's awesome thanks becky yeah so so we learn if you if you read this interview that in the talisman they basically got together they wrote the first 50 pages together in the same room kind of taking turns at the keyboard and then they wrote the the final 50 pages in the same room together but the rest of the book the entire rest of this very long book was written in in by one of them or another in big big chunks like 100 to 150 page chunks basically almost full novel size chunks and this is interesting because for whatever reason, Matt, this didn't occur to me. They wrote this book in 1982, right? 
which means they couldn't just email each other the chunks they were writing. Like they had to print them out or write them on a typewriter and then ship them to each other, which is why the book was written in such big chunks, because it would be completely completely uh, pain, a pain in the ass to have to ship, you know, oh, I did. I worked on 20 pages here today, Steve. Here, check them out. Let me mail them to you halfway across the world and then you can read them and, and call me on the phone and let me know what you think. Um, it, it's just something that, like, obviously I knew, but it, I never really thought about it in that way. Yeah, man, it's hilarious that this never occurred to me. Um, I, I almost can't imagine how this would actually go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, I, I actually am kind of ignorant. Like, when did writers switch over from from using typewriters to using word processors to mm. using computers? You know, do, do, do you remember word processors, Scott? I do. I do. Yeah, it's funny because I think there's probably people of a certain age who think that a word processor just means an application like Microsoft Word, but no, it was it was an unholy hybrid between a typewriter and a. Uh, some kind of digital technology. Um, yeah, we had one in our house, and I would play with it all the time because I was fascinated by it. Me too. It was pretty cool, actually. You know, but maybe there were fax machines in the early '80s. I actually have no idea. There might have been, but like faxing pages and pages and yeah. pages of of 50 words. Pages, yeah. yeah. Yeah, man, this is giving me anxiety just thinking about like, <laughs> you, it, like if you're going to ship it, you got to make carbon copies, and oh my god, oh my yeah. god, yeah, yeah. It's like such a such a big pain in the ass in 1982 for sure, but. Yeah. Matt, Black House was written in 2001, which means there's a thing now called email. Uh -huh. And so that is actually, according to Straub, exactly what they did. They basically at the beginning of the book, they were exchanging emails back and forth, kind of, you know, writing a little bit, but just trying to get a feel for what the book was going to be. Um, and then they met up to draw an outline of what the novel was going to be, which I'm guessing was Straub's idea because King is not really an outliner. He does them occasionally, but not typically his style. Uh, then over the course of a few months, they would email each other much more frequently than they did with the first book with, you know, smaller chunks. So 50 pages, 20 pages, 30 pages, this kind of thing. Still with the other one taking what the person before them wrote and picking up and, and, and carrying it forward a bit. But they were able to be in much more constant communication. And and so the the chunks that each of them worked on independently were were smaller. So definitely a different process here. And I, I think I think one thing we maybe have to pay attention to as we go through this book is how, does this change the way the books feel? You know, I think our biggest complaint about the talisman is, is it's a book that feels like it's written by two people. And we don't necessarily mean that in a good way. Um, is that is this going to be a more cohesive story because of uh, the invention of email? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so so far, honestly, hard to say. There there were yeah. pieces that felt King, and there were pieces that felt Straub. Um, uh, it's it's a weird beginning of a book, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I know we're going to go into it in more detail, but like so so far, I don't know what to think. <laughs> to be honest, we'll we'll, we'll sure. see what happens. We'll see how things evolve. Yeah, definitely. Um, but my understanding was that, 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 like we said, King reached out to Straub here, that this was King's idea. He had an idea for a sequel. He's the one that reached out to Straub and they, um, they made it happen together. So, mm -hmm. um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Makes sense. So the book itself opens with some song lyrics by a band called the Jayhawks, which is a band that was around in the eighties and nineties. But this particular song comes from their 2000 album, uh, called, titled Smile. Um, the name of the song is Queen of the World, and the quote is, you take me to a place I never go, you send me kisses made of gold, I'll place a crown upon your curls, all hail the queen of the world. So curious about what your reaction to this here at the beginning of this book is, Matt. Uh, well, at the time, you know, the only thing that occurred to me is the idea of, of the queen is an idea from uh, the talisman. We have the queen of the territories. We have the queen of the bees, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of of Jack's mom as, as the queen. Um, and I just kind of get territories vibes. It, it's kind of a fantastical fantasy tone we have yeah. in that in that song lyric. Uh, that's all I got for now. I think that's great. And I think that's one. I think you're spot on there. I think a lot of things that this book is doing very early, we're going to get into another big one in a second here, is winking at the talisman because there there is nothing, at least in these first 50 pages, that is like textually talisman related, right? Like we don't see Jack Sawyer. He's not in this first 50 pages. Um, we don't see any characters from the talisman at all yet. Um, we haven't seen any any kind of direct link 
to the talisman. I mean, we get, but but everything we do get is kind of much more looser and much more like winky and like, eh, it, don't you know you're reading a sequel to the talisman? And so this feels like it was put in in here to do that to to specifically make that callback to the talisman. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. And then, Matt, we get into part one, which will be the next four chapters. So this week and next week, um, it is titled Welcome to Cooley County, uh, which has never been so apt a name of a section because we will be spending the next four chapters almost literally just flying around the small Wisconsin town called French Landing, exploring the characters and locations that will be part of the story. And as you said, it's a very um, it's a very interesting opening here. Mm-hmm. Um. So chapter one begins with a way that I think is specifically designed to put a smile on the face of any talisman reader, right? Because the first lines of the, of black house are right here. And now as an old friend used to say, we are in the fluid present where clear sightedness never guarantees perfect vision here about 200 feet, the height of a gliding Eagle above Wisconsin's far Western edge where the vagaries of the Mississippi river declare a natural border. Now, an early Friday morning in mid-July, a few years into both a new century and a new millennium, their wayward course is so hidden that a blind man has a better chance of seeing what lies ahead than you or I. (laughs) So, uh, first of all, we have to say here that you are absolutely correct in your assumption last last week, Matt, that the book would take place in the 2000-2001 time frame. Um, it, it It was a pretty educated guess because King normally writes contemporaneously, right? It makes sense, yeah, and and also I just feel like there's more interesting stuff that they are able to do by letting time pass. You sure, know, pl- you know the authors basically said at the end of the book, th- the story of boyhood is over. Um, you know, this is the end of the story of Jack Sawyer's boyhood, and so this story can't be another story about kids in the same way that that story was. We're probably yeah. going to have kids in the story, but it's not, it's going to be a different. I feel like this is going to be a different type of story. Sure, I think that's fair. Um. So, I mean, there's lots to talk about in this opening here, Matt. I think the first thing we'll talk about is is we've kind of already touched on this, but this is definitely a sequel to The Talisman. If you look at the cover of the book, it says Black House, the sequel to The Talisman. Um, but as I said, we don't have a lot of Talisman specific stuff to really hang our hat on here quite yet. Definitely some Dark Tower stuff, as we'll talk about here in a bit. But anything Talisman related is kind of a passing reference, like, you know, right here and now or like or like clever usage of like, I think there's a, there's a point where they use the word, you know, children dream, dreaming of exploring different territories Mm -hmm. and like the books winking at you or like the movie theater in French landing is called the Agincourt. So that's just another kind of reference there. It's nothing direct or related. I guess the question I have for you here at the beginning is does this lack of any direct talisman connection here at the beginning of this book surprise you? Is this the way you expected it to go? Um, and, and and a follow-up question to that is, do you have any idea of what the, what the talisman connection will be? I guess I figured it would either be, we just immediately pick up with, you know, the son of Jack Sawyer, or it would be, or, or it would be something more like this where, um, it's it's much more unclear and, and we're going to build toward it. We're going to be kind of m- gradually meeting our characters and then they're going to be discovering the mystery um, as we discover the mystery. Sure. Um, as for what the connection will be, you know, I think, well, so, so the the villain so far seems like the most evident and obvious connection. Like whoever, whatever this villain is, they, they seem to have flipping powers. There seems to be something going on with... Um, with with flipping there and and then we have this element of like borderlands which Mm -hmm. reminds me very much of like we'll talk about it when we get to those points but like (laughs) to 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 the 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 ideas of um well just for example thayer school um where where it's sort of sort of a thin spot sort of a sort of the idea that that is um the same idea as what a thinny is in the dark tower Mm -hmm. Um, yeah i I think i think that's a that's a fair guess for sure um there's (laughs) There's, it's just, it's very, I'm trying to think of the way to word this. It, it, it's, just, it's a really interesting choice for me. I mean, like I've never read these books back to back, right? So like I read the talisman and then years and years later I read black house. And so I've never had the experience of going from one to the other. So I, I was kind of as off put by some of the stuff as you were. Uh-huh. And like the, the fact that, you know, we we have no idea. Like, I mean, like, here's a question for you. Like, why are we in Wisconsin? Yeah. Um, 
I don't have a good sense of, of American geography. Um, <laughs> um, I don't I don't know anything about Wisconsin. It seems Wisconsin to me it has that connotation of just being like the, the within the the protected belly of America. It's, it's a place where where bad things never happen. I mean, I think so. So so let's contrast that. The main you know Jack started in he started in the East Coast and he went to the West Coast. Right, he, he crossed the entire United States. And it, this, it, this, he started at, at one extreme, he, he, he went to the other extreme and then he went back again. This mm-hmm. is almost like intentionally beginning just like in the middle. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. And just to give you some exterior information, uh, Peter Straub is from Wisconsin. So like we have, we have the talisman beginning, not in Maine. I think they were in Connecticut, right. But on the, on the East coast, um, which is where, uh, Stephen King usually sets all his stuff, and then we have this book beginning in Wisconsin, the the hometown of Peter Straub. So makes sense. Seems, seems fitting to that, me. That that it seems like a pretty useful piece of information to have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the second big thing we have to talk about here, Matt, is probably that what's going to be the theme of this entire conversation this week is the style of the writing here, because. You can see immediately, even with the first words, that we're doing something very, very different with the narration in this book. King novels often talk to us, the reader. We've, we've pointed out the places in which those novels do that. But they rarely put us in the story like this book is doing. Because we are not just observing the events of this opening and these pages. We are moving through them, right? We move through keyholes. We move under doors. We fly through walls and through ceilings. We smell disgusting things. We we want to turn away from, the, from that disgusting thing. Um, the narration often reacts to the world as if we are actually in the physical space of the place we're exploring, uh, despite you know being invisible and undetectable. It, it's a very interesting choice to, to frame the opening of the story, and, and it, it, it does so throughout these entire chapters, and uh, spoilers, I guess, will continue through the next two chapters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of how in the past you've talked about this idea of how modern writing has become more and more cinematic over time, um, and I feel like... I feel like that is, you know, a big difference between the talisman and this book is that this book mm-hmm. has become more cinematic. We have the the description is as if it's happening on the movie screen, um, that we, as if we are a camera that is moving through space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's that that's right for sure. And I think so. This this kind of brings me to the first big thing we have to talk about here is that a lot of people don't like this book very much, and there are many reasons for that. But I think one of the biggest reasons is the first hundred pages of the story, which encapsulate these two chapters and then the two chapters are going to be covering next week. Um, and, and while, you know, along the course of these hundred pages, we are indeed meeting characters and kind of understanding the setting and what the plot is going to be. What this means is that the book itself really doesn't get moving until like a hundred pages into it. And so full disclosure, the first time I read this book, I was one of the people that didn't care for it very much. I found these first hundred pages quite the drag to get through. I struggled with the first hundred pages of Black House. It took me a long time to read these first hundred pages because I kept picking up the book and putting it down again. I had to start and stop a few times. So uh, this was, to me, one of the things I was most excited to talk to you about in this book because I, I, I want to get your feel on this whole thing. What did you think of this extremely different style and method of storytelling that we see here in the first two chapters of this book? So I have mixed feelings. I have to admit Um, it's, it's a very arm's length approach to the story. Um, You know, the, the, the very, very close third person style that King usually employs, it just drops us into the shoes of characters. And in this case, instead of that, we have, what feels like a much more distant, detached, c- kind of bloodless disconnection from our characters. You know, we're we're watching these people, and we're we're kind of judging them, even you know, mm-hmm. and, and even finding some of them disappointing and sordid, um, rather than like empathizing with their struggles. Um, so it's just a very different feeling, and and that's that's a neutral comment. That's not me saying like, oh, and, and I and therefore I hated it. Like that's just, it's just they're doing a different thing here. I think it's probably the goal is to make us feel a bit different, a bit distant from these characters. We're not really meant to empathize with most of these people. I would say I might be wrong. 
Um, it's not until I would say a bit later that we meet any characters that we like very much. <laughs> and, and we certainly haven't met what we would think of as a protagonist. Um, or at least if we have, I, I, I don't know who it's supposed to be, right? Contrast this with the beginning of The Talisman, where we just immediately are like, here's your protagonist. Yeah, the, the opening lines of The Talisman are almost literally saying, here's Jack, he's your protagonist. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, just like really, really different. You know, it's a, it's gonna, it, I think this is telling us this is a really different story. These are going to be really different themes yeah. from what you might have been expected coming out of The Talisman. Um, again, like, like I can understand struggling to get into this because if you don't know who you're supposed to connect to emotionally and relate to, then it's very hard to, to sink your teeth into a book. Um, but I, you know, I have faith that, that we're, we're going somewhere interesting. Yeah, no, I think you're right. From my perspective on, on revisiting it this time, I enjoyed this a hell of a lot more than I ever have. And I think it's specifically because of the weird project we're doing here and the weird way I have to read these books when I'm reading for the show in that I am, I'm reading for the detail. And I think one thing that this writing has a, a, a ton of is a lot of detail. And so there's a lot of things when, when you, when you already know who the characters are, when you already understand who these people are and you already understand the setting, you can kind of just step back and appreciate the beauty of the writing and, and the, the, the powerful emotions it is trying to summon up. And I really, really enjoy it. Um, it feels entirely Straubian to me. Like these first, these 50 pages, just a hundred percent Straub in my, in my view. Yeah. I mean, definitely if only because it's hard for me to imagine King being this, um, kind of, you know, antiseptic with his characters. Yeah. Like, like, uh, you know, Jerusalem's lot, not Jerusalem's lot, Salem's lot, was a story where we did we did kind of do this thing where we moved around between characters, but that was King's first book, and he was still more like we're sitting in the in the seat of the character, we're experiencing their struggles, even if they're kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> we we kind of empathize with what's going on with them, you know. Sure, that's always been his mo. Yeah, yeah. Um. All right. So I mean, and it's not that we're not going to get that, but yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right that this is designed kind of distance between mm -hmm. us. Um, yeah. Right. And it, yeah, it does, it does make it a little bit more challenging, but we'll see, we'll see how our opinion of this changes as we go through it. Indeed. So we start our tour of French landing by flying over uh, what is called nail house row. And we meet the thunder five, which is a motorcycle game gang slash beer brewers slash philosophy majors. Um, we don't actually get to meet any of these guys yet, Matt, but uh, just here at the top, I love them already. Like the, this, th these wonderful like contradictions, right? Uh, they are these motorcyclists that look like these big, tough motorcyclists, but they are, um, they are philosophy majors. They talk philosophies. They they call themselves the uh, Hegelian scum, right? Yeah, um, it's funny that they we we don't get much more than this quick sketch of them, but they they remind me of the Chatter Society in in, <laughs> in Straub's ghost story. I mainly just say that on the because it's like they're a group of men who, um, I don't know who who meet, <laughs> and and if they're philosophy majors, then the the uh, the Chatter Society and Ghost Story were um intellectuals um so so that that to me strikes me as a little bit of a strabian concept um i i if i have to make a prediction at this point it'll be that the uh the hegelian scum are going to like <laughs> become the scooby-doo gang of, of the story um uh, in, in 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 some sense sure we'll sure we'll see do you want to talk about about hegel and his german <laughs> i i do I, not know philosophy very much I, so I don't know. I don't really know much about I, all I know is like every time I've tried to read up on that particular strain of thought, I just bounce off of it like really hard. And I'm someone who's sort of sort of interested in philosophy. Like I can probably give you a couple of sentences about most of the major philosophers. But Hegel, I don't even know how to say his name. First of Neither all, do I. I, I'm just like, yeah, he was um, he just was he kind of sounds like he's totally full of shit, <laughs> but smart people tell me that there's something there. And I'm like, well, if there is, he certainly doesn't know how to write. Let's just put it that way. It's so funny because when you try to look up like what Hegelian dialect is, like the definition on dictionary.com is 
near incomprehensible. Yeah. Philosophy philosophy an interpretive method in which the contradiction between a proposition thesis and its antithesis is resolved at a higher level of truth synthesis okay uh-huh i don't know what any of that means yeah i i think i could almost un- I, I think i almost understand what that specific thing is because i've tried to figure it out before but he just takes like a, you know uh, why use why use 10 words when 600 will do is, is, sure, is sure. the kind of writer that he is sure. I, and, and i don't think i don't i mean Maybe we could circle back with these guys when we uh, when we know them a bit more, but it's not like we can glean anything from them specifically no. because of this. They, they've they've titled themselves after this philosopher. No, we don't. We don't know anything about that. Yeah, I need like philosophy tube to do an episode on this and explain it to me because I, I don't I don't get it. Yeah, I would love it if somebody could dumb down Hegel enough for me to actually see like what is it that he brought to the scene that was so amazing yeah. at the time. It's possible that it's one of those, you ever heard this idea that like, it's really hard to understand what philosophers contributed because usually if they like, like the more important of a philosopher they are, the more we now just take for granted what it is they contributed. And thus when you, when you hear what they contributed, you're like, yeah, but that's obvious. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, it wasn't obvious before they articulated it. And that's how that's how important their contribution actually was um and maybe he's like that maybe he's one of those where everything he says sounds dumb because it wasn't obvious before he said it i I I think it's it's the opposite of sounds dumb to me is it sounds beyond my (laughs) capability of understanding what the fuck he's actually talking about yeah it sounds like nonsense yeah yeah so we also here get our first hints at, at things not being right in French Landing. We get our first mention of the fisherman, who we will later learn is a, a serial killer who is hunting children in the town. Um, the, we see a poster here that says, fisherman, you better pray your stinking God. We don't catch you first. Remember Amy. And we will learn that Amy. Um, we will learn who Amy is later. One of the, the three victims of the fisherman we know of. And I, I just want like, just to talk generally here, I love the idea that the concept of this being a book about a serial killer hunting a small town is kind of slow rolled out to us. And 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 this is partially because we don't start this book attached to any one character, right? So like we we don't really get it. Like there there you could start the book with uh, here's our protagonist, detective so and so of the of the French Landing Police Department, and he is trying in vain to solve the murders and and we get to a character that is doing that later, but it's pretty clear that they're not our protagonist. And so because we're not attached to one character, like they get to kind of slow roll what the book is actually about. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I I totally forgot about this poster. Um, I literally blanked on it. Like, I think that's, that's one of the problems with this kind of dissociated and floaty style is you don't actually know what's important because nothing is like relative to anything. It's all just data that's, passing into your eyeballs um it's kind of like watching commercials or like flipping through channels where like things don't feel related to each other yeah i think that's the biggest flaw that these chapters have is that in order to remember things you need you need a, the book to kind of explain to you what is and isn't important because you're being pummeled with data and if you have like a character to hook to you can see the character's reaction to things and then that kind of cues in your brain oh that's an important thing because jack cares about it um but here we have no characters we're hanging on to so yeah for me i know this sign this sign is important because this is the first notice the first hint of the fisherman and the bad things happening in town but the first time you're reading this book you don't even know that yet so it's just like oh that's a weird random poster in this town that could just be like flavor text for the the mood of the town or could have some deeper meaning to the plot i don't know yet right and so i'm gonna not i'm gonna file it away in the in the very temporary ram portion of my brain and just delete it <laughs> the second i need something else yeah now i do i do like that you pull it out though because i the, the wording is so interesting pray to your stinking god yeah um that's weird right like, 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 <laughs> like, I mean, what, what it evokes to me is knowing what kind of story we're in is it's like, it's a crimson King is, is your, is your stinking God, you know? Yeah. If you're the bad guy. I mean, that's that, not what, that's not, that's not what they're saying. That's what the authors are saying though. This is great because I pulled this quote out and I never thought about those words. I mean, like the, the, the pure, like the purest reading of it is these are people that are not, uh, religious and they are assuming that the fisherman is, <laughs> yeah. some, you know, like it is such an interesting choice here. Right. Cause like, 
I, I, when I was, when I was religious, I never would have phrased anything that way. Like, yeah, it's like, if, if you're the bad, I would have, I, I would have tried to insinuate that if I was going to, if I was going to construct something like that, I would say like, you're a serial killer. You must worship Satan or something. Yeah. You yeah. know, not whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the, the, the assumption that like he is so bad and so evil and the things he's doing are so monstrous that he must worship some completely different God, some, yeah. some monstrous person. I, I love, I love that. I never thought about that more, mm-hmm. but that's great. So from here we meet more of French landing. I think we kind of move up the street and see portions of the town that, that were once over flooded by the Mississippi. Um, we see kind of the small town charm of the small town businesses in the area and all this stuff. And then we stop at the police station as the morning paper gets delivered. Um, I, I love I love this line here as we see the police station itself. The presence of police cars and barred windows seem incongruous in this rural fastness. What sort of crime could happen here? Nothing serious, surely. Surely nothing worse than a little shoplifting, drunk driving, and the occasional bar fight, which is just like, if you've read any Stephen King, you know the answer to what kind of what kind of things can happen in this this rural fastness of a small town. Uh-huh. Like, uh, the worst, the worst things. Uh-huh. But I love the quaintness of these these words. It's like, it's it's like you 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 the the narrator or the the object or the thing the camera flying through the world is kind of quaintly innocent at the horrors of what small town life could be. Yeah, that's I agree. It's it's ironic. It's, it's yeah. Great. So here at the police station, we meet two members of the FLPD, the young officers, Bobby Dulac and Tom Lund, who seem to be holding the morning paper with uh, with trepidation for some reason. And we quickly learn to understand why uh, local muckraker Wendell Green is out to get the police department and its chief, Dale Gilbertson, for their failure to apprehend a local serial killer who has killed two young children and taken a third. Uh, so your reaction to this being a serial killer story, Matt, I guess just your general reaction here. I mean, it's definitely way more horrible and nightmarish and just kind of <laughs> deeply unfun um, than the premise of the talisman. Like, yeah, like there's nothing about Albert Fish that allows me to just like let go and enjoy the ride. Like I I just want it to not exist <laughs> and and bringing it into f- fiction to me. I'm just like, well, that's this is this can't be a fun adventure. This is going to be really unpleasant um i I, we'll we'll talk more about the idea of of serial killers as as we go but like it's so much more um real and upsetting than any any of the idea i mean the the talisman dealt with some serious stuff don't get me wrong it dealt with the idea of of boys being abused and and uh and and exploited by the world um, and there were some very serious situations, but like, you know, woven throughout that was werewolves <laughs> yeah, and magic keys. And, and right. And like right now we're just being confronted with just absolute horror. That's very, very real and feels very like grounded. Um, yeah. I think you're right. The, the, the horrifying moments in the talisman were always layered into this being an odyssey type you know, adventure story. Mm -hmm. This book is not that, and it's declaring itself not that here at the very beginning. And I mean, like, if you remember our our first week discussing the talisman was kind of one of not confusion, but like, we were like, man, this is a really fucking dour book. Like this kid is just sad. And, and this, this place, this beach he's living in is like run down and emptied. And like, there's no light or anything in the, in his world at this moment. But like, even that had such a different flavor than what we're seeing in these, in these words, the beginning of this book. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So we also get a bunch of random information that we just don't know how to parse yet. So like there, we hear that there, there's some person they're calling Hollywood, a young retired person who apparently helped them solve a case a while back. Also, we learn about George Rathburn, the local DJ, who we'll hear again and again you know, as we fly through Fisherman for, through French Landing. He's kind of the 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 voice of the town, um, and this is we've kind of already talked about this, but I'll reiterate it. This is I think why people struggle with this opening so much. I know all these folks, right? I know who Hollywood is. I know who George Rathburn is. And and I know how to place them in the context of the story. You don't, right? And, and, And I can look at this and see how cleverly we're kind of 
slowly laying out the pieces for us. But you can't because you don't know yet. And so that combined with this thick, colorful prose really just you don't have purchase. You don't have anything to grab onto and hold onto as you work your way through these pages. Yeah. Um, again, I'm going to go with my metaphor of flipping channels. It, it is hard yeah. to get purchase. I, I'm going to be kind of brutal here, like un, unusually critical for me, I guess. Like if this if this intro was sent to me as a piece of writing that somebody wanted me to like provide commentary and critique on, like, like you know, what do you think of this, Matt? Like I'd be pretty harsh on it. I'd be like, look, I don't care about anything that's happening. I'm not hooked. I'm confused. I I, I don't know what's important. You got to give me something to hold on to here. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I will say, I, I'm 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 gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna reel back my criticism. <laughs> we we do eventually get there. It just takes a bit. Um, sure. At this point, I'm still very lost, though. And and I think the thing once we're finished with this opening section next week, the thing I, I kind of want us to return to is, can we get to the bottom of of the why of this? Right, like. This this is uh, choices were made here to start the book this way, and do we think those choices, you know, improved the book? Do we think the book would have is better than it could have been had it had it opened in a much more traditional way? Mm-hmm. Obviously, we can't answer that question yet because we're not done. But uh, I think that's something I, I would like to try to get to the bottom of. Yeah, I I, I have some thoughts about that. I'll, I'll bring those up when we get to that point. Sure. So we learn here more about the fishermen as they read the morning paper. We learn about how he's killed and partially consumed two children, Amy St. Pierre and Johnny Urkhamham. Uh, the third missing child is Irma Frenau. Uh, I think it, it's important to note here that the St. Pierre child, Amy, is the daughter of one of the Thunder Five. That's something we also learn here. So that's kind of what we see. They have a vested interest in the poster. Maybe makes a little more sense as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we also learn that the reporter, Wendell, who who is the one who has dubbed the fisherman, who has given him his name, also seems to be kind of egging on this this violence that's starting to spread through the town as people get more worried and more panicked and are starting to to hunt for the fisherman. Um, he He's kind of instigating it in a lot of ways. Um, I, I love this line here. And when will French Landing's chief of police, Dale Gilbertson, do his duty and rescue the citizens of this county from the obscene savagery of the fishermen and the understandable violence produced by his own inaction? It's just like, oh, it's under, it's understandable that you're just beating up random people on the street that you think are the fishermen. Uh huh. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, de- definitely. We have the elements of a powder keg. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So we then leave uh, this scene behind and head over to another cheery site, Matt. We move on to the Maxton Elder Care Facility, whose director, William Maxton, is your classic Stephen King nice guy. He's stealing money from old people and also cheating on his wife with his secretary. Hooray! (laughs) Yay. I I missed this archetype of King character. It's been a while. (laughs) Good to see you, buddy. I love this 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 line here. We assume that she's Chipper's secretary, and this assumption, too, expresses only half of the truth. As the ease and irony of her attitude imply, Miss Villas' duties have extended beyond the purely secretarial. We might speculate about the source of the nice ring she is wearing, as long as our minds are in the gutter. We will be right on the money. <laughs> uh, that's great. I really do enjoy how, you know, seedy and shitty this whole situation is. Um, yeah. Maybe. And I, I yeah. love how the writing really enhances that, too. Like, like there's I don't know how much of this is written by King, but there is he he's, he really excels at making these terrible characters just kind of really fun to read about. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the real estate guy in Salem's Lot. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very, yeah. Very fun. We then fly around spying on a a few different old people. Um, And I love this line here. Since nearly everyone is asleep, we can glance in a few of these quarters, which is like you're and you're ghost. Yeah. Like, like, what do you mean? Since everyone's asleep? I love how the, the, the book like is, is almost by design inconsistent about our ability to be noticed or exist in the world as we fly through things and around things and, and like, Oh, since everyone's asleep, we can just check on them. You know, it's just yeah. so fascinating. Well, it's like, it's like, it's like we're a vampire or something. You know, it's yeah. like we're an incorporeal thing. It's like we're being brought in. I mean, so, so this is, I'll, I'll give a hint now as to the, the positive consequence of this approach is it does begin to make us feel like we're there. Sure. We, like we are there, not like, Oh, we're sitting in the shoes of this character, but like we are voyeuristically sitting in this space, actually. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And that causes certain impressions. Definitely. Um, I think it, it makes some of the most disturbing parts hit a little bit harder for sure. I, I agree with that. Um, so we we kind of spy on a bunch of old people until we get to the quote one we are here to see who is Charles Bernie Burnside. And as we meet him, we end our chapter and move right into chapter two, our second and final chapter of the week. Um, and, and we learn here a little bit about about Charles Burnside here, Matt. We learn that he he doesn't exist or he doesn't exist on any kind of formal documents. He one day showed up randomly to the local hospital. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and stuck in Maxton's temporarily until a spot in the hospital, the the long-term hospital opened up for him. But then suddenly random checks from his family member who doesn't exist started showing up to pay for his room there. And so, so Mr. Maxton was like, sure, he can stay here. Uh, All very, very mysterious, right? Yeah, this is a mystery that I can sink my teeth into. Um, <laughs> in fact, I came very close to texting you as this chapter began um, saying this book should have started with this chapter. Uh, <laughs> this should have been the beginning because this is, this is you know, uh, uh, we have a character. He sucks, obviously, but he is immediate and, and real and we can we can be interested in what's going on here. It's a cool mystery. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel... This is where I kind of started to feel like, okay, this is this is fun. I'm kind of getting into this. Sure, sure. And uh, as you said, Bernie, not not a good dude, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I love the writing here. He is a true American loner, an internal vagrant, a creature of shabby rooms and cheap diners, of aimless joys resentfully taken, a collector aimless journeys resentfully taken, a collector of wounds and injuries lovingly fingered and refingered. Here is a spy with no cause higher than himself. Bernie's real name is Carl Beerston, and under that name he conducted in Chicago from his mid-twenties until the age of 46 a secret rampage, an unofficial war, during which he committed wretched deeds for the sake of the pleasures they afforded him. Carl Beerston is Bernie's great secret, for he cannot allow anyone to know that this former incarnation, this earlier self, still lives inside his skin. Carl Beerston's awful pleasures, his foul toys, are also Bernie's, and he must keep them hidden in the darkness, where only he can find them. It's great. It's great. It's such good writing. I love I love a true American loner, an internal vagrant, a creature of shabby rooms and cheap diners, of aimless journeys resentfully taken. Uh, it's just like it's one of those things. And I know you've talked about this with King before, but like those words don't necessarily mean anything, <laughs> but they provide an image like immediately and yeah. like a, an emotional connection and core to a character. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean. I, I totally agree like it uh this only this is only now occurring to me this didn't occur to me at, at the time but it's almost like this is this is this guy is kind of a an evil reflection of a lot of our wanderer characters from the dark tower like interesting you know we had father callahan um roland to an extent of course um uh, uh, uh ted brodigan those are kind of the three that jump to mind immediately as being our 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 American wanderers, right? Uh, well, two of them are American wanderers anyway. Uh, hmm. And and the the point is, this guy is like a an evil, shitty version of those of, of that archetype. Um, sure. I, I know we don't have a lot to go on right now, but I'm just kind of that's what the that's the mental impression this gives me. Yeah, I like that, and I mean, like you know we talked a lot about in the talisman, how this is a, 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 an American story, right? The mm-hmm. idea of traveling cross country is just this, this essentially American thing where this fucking country is so big and so sprawling that, you know, traveling across it can be a story in and of itself. And it seems to be a contradiction of that as well. A, a, an inverse of that in a lot of ways. Yeah. I like that. And the other thing we learned about Bernie is is he does he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it seems like this was a correct diagnosis and he is getting worse and worse as the years go on. But then he this weird thing happens where sometimes he goes from being a late stage Alzheimer patient and then it's like a light switch flips on and he's just a normal, you know, a normal, like healthy brain that is working. Um and he seems to flip back and forth between these. Flip, flip back and flip, forth. Flipping back and <laughs> forth between uh, something, something territories, something Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it also kind of reminds us of um, 
uh, Susanna and Mia. But, um, sure, but I think sure. more, more approximately reminds us of something related to the territories. Sure. Sure. I, I really like, I really like this sentence about him at, as well. The human soul contains an infinity of rooms. After all, some of them vast, some no bigger than the broom closet, some locked, some some few imbued with a radiant light. This idea that like there is infinity, you are capable of an, in, infinite things inside you. I love I love that image. Yeah, me too. It's beautiful. So what's your overall reaction to, to Bernie here? Um, well, I was left strongly suspecting that Bernie is the serial killer that we're concerned with. He's the fisherman. But the book doesn't really tell us that as far as mm-hmm. I am aware. Um, the book is careful not to say that as far as I can tell. Uh, so maybe I'm just being too paranoid, but that makes <laughs> me not want to jump to conclusions and and be like, okay, the book the book is hinting that he might be the serial killer, but I think I think it's not quite going to be that simple. Um, so I think he's I think he's not the serial killer, despite oh. despite the fact that maybe we're it's being hinted in that direction. Okay, okay. No, that's I mean that's interesting. We'll definitely continue to talk about this as we go. I guess the question I have for you right now is, do you think this is you know, there are two types of mystery stories, right? There's the mystery story where the reader doesn't know the who done it and is learning the information along with the characters. And then there's the mystery story in which the reader does know who done it and is learning uh, and is watching the characters solve the mystery. Do, do you have an idea of which you think this this could be? I mean, okay, if this guy is the serial killer then we're probably this is probably the 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 one where we 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 know he's a serial killer or it, it'll be it'll be made clear to us and then and then we are, are are watching our characters try to figure it out um i guess i lean toward that direction which kind of makes me lean toward the direction that this guy is actually the serial killer <laughs> but, um <laughs> or you know his twinner is the serial killer well, whatever however you want to slice that okay cool yeah. So we move away from Bernie and Maxton's and Strawberry Fest for a moment and head into the woods of French Landing to meet our titular Black House. Um, I'm finding it very difficult here, Matt, to not just pull like quote after quote after quote, because I just I do truly like structurally. I have a lot of problems with the first few chapters of this book, but like the individual moment to moment beat to beat writing is just is just wonderful to me. I just adore it so much. Um, I, I love the way we're brought to this black house. I love the way we see this, this like hidden road that like is both uninviting and also almost invisible. Um, and, and, and I love, I love this line here more a lane than an actual road. It's air of privacy seems at odds with its apparent uselessness. It's just like, that's such a great turn of phrase that I just love so much. Yeah. Yeah. I love the description in here. And then as we approach, we walk down the road, the house itself materializes um, and it's it's a weird, it's a weird, weird house. The description here says in both senses of the word, the building looked unbalanced An off kiltered mind conceived it, then relentlessly brought it into off center being the intractable result deflects inquiry and resists interpretation An odd monolithic invulnerability emanates from the bricks and boards despite the damage done by time and weather obviously built in search of seclusion if not isolation the house seems still to demand them so it's just a really unusual uncomfortable weird place unbalanced off kilter uh what do you think what do you think of the black house yeah um well so i'm not getting the vibes that this is supposed to be you know the dark tower stand in for this story um which we may have suggested previously because it's a big black building it's gonna be (laughs) you know it's like the the evil hotel or it's like the dark tower it's like no this is not it's not it doesn't seem to be those things it seems to be something else um and i don't i don't know what else from there you know it's definitely going to be important to the story because that's what the book's called but i don't know beyond that yeah and i think that would have been a fair assumption to make you know you you move from a book that has the black hotel and we're, we're told over and over again about this black hotel and you would maybe kind of make assumption an assumption that the sequel to that book titled black house there's some connection between the black hotel and the black house and, right. and maybe there will be but yeah off the cuff it's not a clear tower metaphor yeah exactly 
so we, the other thing we learn is that almost no one in town knows about this mysterious black house. It's like if they did, they've kind of forgotten about it in some weird kind of mystical way. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I, that, so, you know, some something something magical is going on here for yeah. sure. Yeah. And then the book kind of halts our tour to talk about borderlands and slippage. And this is, I think, my favorite part of this chapter. At this moment in our progress, and through everything that follows, we would do well to remember that this strange flavor of the dreamlike and slightly unnatural is characteristic of borderlands. It can be detected in every seam between one specific territory and another, however significant or insignificant the border in question. Borderlands places are different from other places. They are borderish. This is, I think, you know, perhaps the biggest talisman connection that we've seen in the book so far, right? You know, we have, again, the, a cheeky use of one specific territory or another. Um, but the idea of the Borderlands would would fit right into our understanding of the Thayer School and what happened at the Thayer School that that night, right? Like, the, the, like the, we... We have this distinct weird thing that happened where worlds seem to be meshing and, you know, you called it a thinny and I think that was very apt. Um, and it's this this weird mesh of two different worlds kind of crowding together. And that's that's what happens at, at borders here. Yeah, there's also the the tunnel um, to uh, I forget the name of the, the shitty little town. Um, Oakley. Oakley, yeah, the, the, the town, the, the tunnel to o Oatley where... Um, uh, Jake has kind of a weird surreal experience and it gives mm -hmm. us the sense that so like the, the tu a tunnel is is clearly a a, a place in between um, so that um, a, a borderland place you know yeah um, so yeah I, I think that's just another element that we're bringing along sure and then at borderlands we understand you know what 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 is borderish what happens at borderlands well that's where we get our concept of slippage and the book introduces slippage thusly have you ever seen a furious old wreck in worn out clothes who pushes an empty shopping cart down deserted streets and rants about a fushing thief? Sometimes he wears a baseball cap, sometimes a pair of sunglasses with one cracked lens. Have you ever moved frightened into a doorway and watched a soldierly man with a zigzag lightning bolt scar on one side of his face storm into a drunken mob and discover lying spread eagle in death on the ground, a boy, his head smashed and pockets turned out? Have you ever seen an anger and pity blaze in that man's mutilated face? These are signs of slippage. So, yeah. I mean, that's a direct talisman <laughs> reference there, right? Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, so so clear, clear talisman reference is the... Fushing thief um, idea from from the end of the last book. I, I I don't think I'm reaching too much to say that the the guy with a lightning shaped scar on his forehead, I mean face, is um is is our our <sighs> blanking on names today. I don't know what's wrong with my brain. The guy who um started Jack out on his quest um starts speedy. With the, no, uh, starts with an F or an R or something. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> now, I, now I had it and then Faramir popped into my head and now that's all that's uh -huh. there. I know what you're talking about. But yeah, the, the kid lying, the boy lying spread eagle down on, is the boy crushed by the cart who is robbed in, in the territories. And, like and that is. And this guy is is the guy who because he had a scar on his face. The, the he guy, did, correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 it's like, you know the the idea that you're there watching yeah um yeah okay good I, i'm glad i'm not crazy that, that, yeah no. that, that's where i thought we were going with that okay so yeah we're, we're we're defining this concept of slippage and saying like slippage is is i think later he says another definition of slippage is the feeling that bad things are about to get way way worse and so it's this idea you know in the so basically what we said is the territories at the time of the talisman were a place where slippage was occurring, where things were breaking down and getting worse. And now we're told specifically that that is something that is happening here in French landing. The things that, that at this borderland, at this border between places, between worlds, whatever you want to call it, things are starting to break down. Things are getting worse. Um, things are, are not good and they're going to get, get way, way worse. Okay. I, I hope they don't get worse, Scott. I uh, hope, uh, hope Matt, everything's okay. They're going to get, worse oh no so we move on from the black house to one of uh, not one of the most horrifying event of the chapter right we move into the abandoned wreck of ed's eats and dogs a terrible disgusting restaurant that i can't believe people actually ate at uh, and and here king and straub kind of 
chase the squirrel here a bit, right? They they king explain for us the entire history of Ed's eats and dogs and its deceased owner. We we spend a few pages talking about and describing this place, what it was like at its heyday, and what its owner was like, and all these things. And and I I, I love this detail. I love when King does this. Generally, we've talked about this a lot, but you know, going back to the why of it all, I was thinking about the why in this moment. Take the time to to define Ed and his previous establishment that is now abandoned but still standing here and i think it's literally to create this this feeling that what we're about to show you is so dark and so disturbing that i don't want to show it to you so i'm going to prolong the moment before as much as possible by like segueing into oh before we go before we do this let me just talk to you about ed because ed Oh man, Ed, he's so great. I don't want to talk about the dead uh, child in the other room being eaten by a dog. So let's just let's just talk about Ed for a bit. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it really builds the sense of unpleasant dread. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not, I think this is the point to mention that the fact that we have situated our point of view as like a floating observer that's been identified with like us specifically, mm-hmm. not not some character who we're inhabiting and thus allowed to have some kind of distance. It's like you were, you were there in this room that gives it an immediacy and, and horror that I think maybe we sometimes allow ourselves to escape from through that level of indirection. Um, Yeah. I think that's, that's one thing that helps. It is. You're you're so right. It's really fascinating. And I think this is, I'm almost going to contradict myself here, but there is this moment where I think a lot of this writing it holds you at a distance from your characters a bit. Like, like the, we're not really in any of the characters' heads, but we also kind of are. But because we're this external entity that is existing in the space, actually, we're kind of one step removed from the characters in the way a typical, traditional, third-person, omniscient-type narration wouldn't do. Mm-hmm. But yet, when we come to being in a scene of discur- dis- disturbing things, it actually puts us closer to them. Mm-hmm. Like we, we are, we are further removed from character, but we are closer to horror in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I find this actually surprising. Like I agree. I totally agree with that. With what you just said. And I'm like, I wouldn't have expected that to work. Like I was, mm-hmm. it seems backwards to me, but it's yeah. just totally the case. You know, I mean, yeah. I, um, I, I, I find this remarkably upsetting. Like the, this, yeah. this bit that we're, you know, getting into with the, with, with the, the dead child, I, I was like, um, it is unpleasant. It is, it, it, I, I kind of don't want to read it. I kind of want to skip over it and like, think about, you know, I didn't feel that way about Wolf tearing these, you know, adolescent boys apart limb from limb. And, and like, I didn't it, like, like, like bad stuff happening. Books is usually, kind of fun and awesome even if it's if it's if it's kind of fucked up it's still kind of awesome you know yeah um and this is not allowing us to feel that way no um, not at, at all. all yeah not at all <laughs> right and i think like that's the, the 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 message that this sends to you is you know that this book is dark <laughs> mm-hmm. that this book is mean and 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 like you talked about earlier in the episode it's such a stark crap contrast to the talisman a book you know like we said where bad things happen but but it's you know and it's an adventure and mm-hmm. we're going on a we're going on a journey and yes bad things happen but like there's hope at the end of the line there's there's warmth and goodness and this is just okay here's a 10 year old dead girl her her leg has been chopped off and and we're introduced to the scene by seeing a dog like meticulously work its way to get the foot of the child out of the sneaker it's been left in and that is i mean such a choice too because like you know we we have such emotional attachment to dogs in general as companions and and we introduce this wild dog as the thing like desperately trying to eat this kid's foot and it's just so fucking disturbing yeah yeah, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I, I I do think it's extremely fascinating, and I I am interested to see where the book goes with this. Like you and I were having this conversation earlier about how, um, in some of the stories that we've read as a as a team, just incredibly creatively fucked up stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but that you n- neither of the two of us has ever really been that bothered by it. Like we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're in fact, I'm kind of like that was kind of awesome, you know, um. And this is like the thing about this is that this is just like too real. 
Like this is the kind of thing that actually happens. We're seeing it in a very unvarnished and a, a sort of objective way. And it makes it really impossible for us to feel anything, but just utterly, you know, uh, uh, bad about it. Yeah. But, but interestingly, the book, like it doesn't, <laughs> It doesn't want you to feel too bad, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I love what, what it says next here. We are not here to weep. Not like Ed, anyhow, in this horrified shame and disbelief. A tremendous mystery has inhabited this hovel, and its effects and traces hover everywhere about us. We have come to observe, register, and record the impressions, the after images left in the comet trail of the mystery. It speaks from their details. Therefore, it lingers in its own wake. Therefore, it surrounds us. A deep, deep gravity flows outward from the scene, and this gravity humbles us. Humility is our best, most accurate first response. Without it, we would miss the point. The great mystery would escape us, and we would go on deaf and blind, ignorant as pigs. Let us not go on like pigs. We must honor this scene. The flies, the dog worrying the severed foot, the poor pale body of Irma Frenau, the magnitude of what befell Irma Frenau by acknowledging our littleness. In comparison, we are no more than vapors. So that's such a fascinating choice, right? The book says, hey, I know I know you're horrified. I know what you just saw here was horrifying and terrible, and all you want to do is leave right now. But this is important. You have to take this in. You have to understand the, the gravity of this and not just the horror of it, but what it means it is such a fascinating choice to me. Yeah. And I don't quite know where we're going with it. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's fascinating, but I don't know. I don't understand yet. Like, so, so we're directly addressing the idea that we should approach this kind of horror with a different stance then we might approach a room where like a bunch of zombies are, mar- are munching on a dude or something. Cause, cause the latter is not real. We know it's mm-hmm. not real. You can't get us to care about it all that much. You can get us to care some if we care about the character, but we know it's not real, but th- this is too close to real. This is too horrible because it's too real. And, and so we're taking it seriously and we're, we're relegating ourselves to the position of being vapor in contrast to the reality of this scene yeah. Which is which is kind of interesting because it's not real. It is fiction. Sure. But it's something that could very well happen in our world. Yeah. Um so yeah, I don't quite know what to do with it. I'm 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 holding on to this as an important piece of what we're doing with this story, but it but it hasn't clarified itself to me yet. Just the idea of the best, most accurate first response to to witnessing the severed leg of a child that's been murdered and and eaten is humility Mm -hmm. is just like you kind of want to stop and go why not anger why not disgust why not rage why not uh you know just simple sadness uh, sorrow yeah Yeah, like like humility like that look this is greater than you it's greater than me it's it's greater than than irma frenow and it all matters and it's all part of something that is bigger and and more enormous and huge than we would ever be. So, you know, bow down before its bigness in a lot of ways. It's yeah. like emotion is not what you need to be feeling right now. I, I, I think I follow what you mean, but I still don't I still don't know what we're doing. And, sure. and that's fine. I'm not saying we have to figure it out right now. Sure, sure. Uh, Speaking of which, though, speaking of what are we doing into this scene of mystery, we're told a fat bee wanders in and the book zooms in on this bee, right? The book basically tells us, hey, reader, uh, this bee matters, too. Uh There's a bee and the bees in the scene now. And so that's the bees part of the mystery, Matt. And so pay attention to the bee. Uh But like it's (laughs) like, but yeah, like exactly. The, the book is signposting all this stuff for us, right? Like I, through this narrative style, it's it's telling us to pay attention to things. It's talking to us directly. This matters. Pay attention to it. And and it's almost as if the book is directly acknowledging that it's a book, that this is a story and, and we're just observing it. But even, even though it's just a story and we're just observe, observing it, we owe it respect. Even this bee, we must pay attention to. Even this little thing is is more important than us for some reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I think everything you're saying is correct. Let's <laughs> <laughs> but you understandably have no idea what to do with any of it. I feel like I, I feel like I understand 
this part of of a puzzle that that is definitely way bigger than what I'm seeing right now. I, I don't know if that made any sense, but no, it did. It did. Okay. Um, I, I love the the other response to this is like, okay, we've we've done this scene, but is there anywhere we can go in this town where under the skin there's niceness? Uh-huh. <laughs> Short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah the, the the vibe of the town really reminds me of the town where the talisman starts because yeah. everything in that town also just sucks pervasively yeah and i think it does fit you know you already mentioned salem's lot and i think it does fit the the general kingian small town idea where under the skin of the town there is rot and horror and bad um and basically what we're told here is there's nowhere in this town that that isn't true. We can't go to a nice place. We can go to a nicer place, and that is where we will go from here. But a nice place, no. Yeah, right. So that's what we do. We go to a nicer place, and and at least it is a nicer place right now. We're kind of told explicitly it's, it's about to not be. <laughs> but um, we move to a section of town called Libertyville with street names right out of old English folk stories. We have Camelot. We have Avalon, Maid Marian Way, Robin Hood Lane. Uh, think of that what you will, Matt. Uh, mm-hmm. any, any opinions on, on that specifically? Um, I mean, we're just – it's – fantastic right it's it's uh uh, we're thinking of kings and queens and and quests right yeah it i mean like there is i'm trying to think of a way to say this without spoiling anything but there is a version of the story in which ty marshall is the main character just Mm -hmm. like jack sawyer was the main character of of the talisman right right um and so he's this kid that's living in fan in fantasyville and he's gonna get to go on his fantasyville quest but we're told in this this section right here, nope, actually, he's going to be the fisherman's fourth victim. So fantasy town is closed. Libertyville, not free. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I'm, I, that, that's a good point. Like it's it's almost, you know, this is one of those evil forces in the Dark Tower universe that is trying to kind of undermine and extinguish all of the the things that are of the white. Um and, you know, we need our champion of the white to come fight against it, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, it's here in Libertyville that we find the Marshall family. Fred Marshall, the father, is about to go on his morning run, and he's reading the paper and worried about the fisherman himself, worried about his son, and then, of course, as we see, worried about his wife for an entirely different reason that we'll get into shortly. Um, and and I, I already said it, but I'm just going to re- reiterate it here. It's here at the beginning of the chapter that we're told specifically that Ty Marshall, Tyler, uh, Fred's son, is going to be the fisherman's fourth victim. The, the book tells us that directly. I think, I think the first introduction to it is Fred reading the paper and thinking about how, how horrible it would be to be the father of, of one of those children. And the book says, oh, you'll know soon enough, Fred. Um, and, and, and it reminds us of this again and again throughout the section. So the, the, it, it makes it clear to me, at least, that the book wants you to view every scene in the rest of this chapter from the perspective of this family's whole existence is about to be rocked to its core. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once again, we're continuing this, this disquieting dreadful tone um, that's been persistent throughout the movie. But now, now that we have uh, not movie book, uh, but we have, now we have specific characters that we actually care about. And so it's intensifying in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I love this line here. Body parts hanging from chains in a crumbling hen house. That is the part which haunts him. Can that really be? Can it be here, right here and now in Tom Sawyer, Becky Thatcher country? Um, I, I love this for a few reasons. First of all, Tom Sawyer, of course, you uh-huh. know, directly related to the talisman. Again, putting us in like this is this is a world of of cross country adventures and happiness. And no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, I also really find it the choice to take the phrase right here and now, which is a phrase that upon reading the talisman kind of fills you with happiness because it reminds you of wolf the character that you love mm-hmm. and and twisting it yeah into this this horror show yeah it's like it's take like it's like the book is wanting to disarm us it's like it's reminding us of of wolf and making us happy but no right here and now is horror is dread is is murder and torture and cannibalism and all these terrible terrible things yeah 
no, it's, it's, it's almost a slap in the face to, like you said, take, take this, this phrase that we have these positive associations with and, and almost like, um, laugh at how stupid we are to, yeah. to, to believe yeah. that like, you know, this is going to be a story where everything's going to be okay. Um, I, I, everything up to this point has been building toward like this is not going to be a story where everything is going to be okay this is <laughs> not an adventure this is going to be a horrible um nightmare <laughs> yeah so do you think uh, is this something that had this not been a sequel they would not have had to put as much work into doing this. I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, do you think this is a result of them knowing that the talisman is a very specific kind of book and that the readers buying this book would have a certain level of expectation based on the talisman? Or is this just the kind of table setting that anyone can and should be doing at the beginning of their novel? Um, no, no, I actually do think this book is in reaction to the way the talisman was written okay. and, and what it was about. Um, I, I don't think that this is the way that these authors would have chosen to write this book if somehow they had conceived of this concept first. I, I think a lot of this is situating it, um, not, not just in the practical sense of saying like, okay, dear reader, strap in because this is not going to be what you expect, but they're, 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 they're carefully painting a picture that that is intentionally in tension with the talisman it is it is intentionally in contrast to and in, in contradiction to the kind of story that we told in the talisman um, yeah i i completely agree with that yeah. yeah okay so as fred is going on his morning run his his mind turns back to his wife judy marshall who he is also worried about um we learn here that judy has you know to put it lightly seemingly started to go insane mm -hmm. uh, we see here there is gibberish when she sleeps there's the way her eyes dart hither and yon and let's not forget the time just three days ago when he followed her into the kitchen and she wasn't there she turned out to be behind him coming down the stairs <clears throat> uh, <laughs> what, what could be happening here <laughs> i mean isn't it so fascinating though this is what we talked about before but like the people reading this book know this is a sequel to the talisman the people writing this book know that you know that this is a sequel to the talisman and yet we're kind of like lampshading all this territory stuff because all of our point of view characters are people that don't know about any of this stuff like we're not with jack like imagine if jack was if if we learned this stuff by having this guy talk to Jack or someone else that knows about the territories, then we would get their reaction and it would be much more direct and real. Oh, she's just flipping into a different world like I did when I was a kid or something like that. That's not what's happening here at all. It's like this clever kind of winking at you, the the hovering reader um, while the the main character is just entirely ignorant, it's this this very specific kind of dramatic irony here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of I kind of like it actually. Um, I do too. I and, do too. And, and clearly, um, the the character herself doesn't know what the hell's going on. Um, yeah, yeah. Like she's 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 uh, uh, she. I think she probably thinks she's going crazy just as mm -hmm. much as her husband does. Yeah. But we learn that his biggest worry about his wife is that she seems suddenly afraid, something he's never seen in her before ever. And and to to exemplify this, uh, we go on a little king diversion here, Matt, a little chasing. I, I, we never settled on a name for him, so I'm just going to call it something different every time. Perfect. Um, we go on this, this little flashback where Fred recalls his wife's lack of fear on one of their very first dates where uh, they were walking along the street and two men were in a car accident and one of the men was very pissed off and he gets out of his car holding a pipe ready to beat the shit out of the other guy and she walks up and stands between the middle of them and just uh, just stops them. And, and, and the important part of course is never once she was afraid or concerned for himself. He, he, he asks her after the fact and says something to the effect of like, weren't you worried he would hit you with the pipe? And she's like, huh. And it really crossed my mind actually. Mm -hmm. It's such a great little vignette. I love it so much. Yeah, no, it's delightful. It, it kind of made me feel like she was going to be something of a protagonist, um, which, you know, it's taken us this long to meet a character who is even a candidate for the protagonist. So that tells mm -hmm. us how different these stories are. Um, we have no idea actually whether she will be, uh, 
whether she'll be a protagonist or whether this is the only time we'll see her. But uh, in any case, I, I like her. Like the fact that we learn that she's like strong and kind of gunslingerly that that makes us like her. Yeah, and I, I hope that uh, nothing bad happens to her. We will find out. Uh, and we move from Fred over to Judy. Um, and here's where things get towery, Matt, because Judy is sitting in bed, kind of zoned out and talking to herself. Eye of the king, she repeats. And now it starts with the hands, kneading and twisting and squeezing and digging. Abela, foxes down foxholes. Abela Dune, the crimson king, rats in their rat holes. Abela Munchen, the king is in his tower, eating bread and honey. The breakers in the basement, making all the money. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> well there you go it's the crimson king is back once again yep. this is explicitly a dark tower novel now it's not just vaguely referenced and hinted at here it is crimson king yep our good old she, good old catfish friend she even gets a, 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 a we even see she's dreaming of the tower we see the tower itself and the field of roses beneath it so this is very very direct of course the big thing is the breakers are referenced here matt the breakers who in uh, the the Dark Tower chronology don't exist yet technically because we haven't gotten to those books yet. They're, they've not been published yet. Yeah, this is what I meant earlier when I said we were seeing things a little bit out of order because I think he's thinking of these things even if they're not published. Um, yeah, my, my guess is he's kind of writing or planning that or or I guess we can put it the phrase is he's hearing the song of the turtle uh-huh. as he's writing this book. Yeah, I like so that. I like that. He's got a lot of the Dark Tower stuff on his mind. Yeah. And who he works it in here. I mean, I guess that's a good question. I wonder, like, you know, we talked about King had this idea for a sequel and he's he had this idea for a long time and he never really did anything with it. And then after his accident, he came to Peter Straub and he said, you know, I've had this idea for a sequel to this thing for a while. You want to do it with me? And Straub, of course, said yes. I wonder if the Dark Tower stuff was always part of that idea or it's like something that occurred to him in the moment as he's crafting this thing. That's like, oh, I'm working on the Dark Tower. I'm thinking about this a lot. And this is a way I could link them together. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'll withhold judgment until we've gotten farther through the story. Yeah. Uh, so we also see here that uh, she says the black house is the doorway to Abela, the entrance to hell, Sheol, Munchen, all the worlds and spirits. So now we know what the black house is, Matt. It's a door. It's a door. Yeah, I think I knew it was going to be a door because that's because sure. because evil houses are always doors in the Dark Tower. <laughs> um, but the question to me is, is it a door to... Um, is, is is Abela the territories or is Abela midworld? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think Abela, by the way, is a phrase that we don't it, recognize. It's not something we've seen before, but I, I just wanted to point out that it is one of the things that Bernie, Charles Burnside, says as well in his mutterings. He says the word Abela. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then before we leave, leave, leave Judy herself behind, she mentions Burnside specifically. She's in her muttering to herself. She says, Charles Burnside is not your real name, is it? So these two and whatever weird is happening to Judy is connecting her to Bernie as well. Yeah, yeah. There's some uh, twittering stuff. For sure. And in the last bit of the chapter, we go to the fourth Fisher, the fourth Fisher victim himself, Tyler Mar- Tyler Marshall, who is just waking up. I love I love this beat here with Tyler, the poster on his wall, the poster of a dark castle at the end of a meadow, and and what the text says here. He doesn't like the poster because he has any interest in Ireland. To him, the picture whispers of somewhere else, somewhere entirely else. It is like a photograph of some splendid mythical kingdom where there might be unicorns in the forest and dragons in the caves. Never mind Ireland. Never mind Harry Potter either. Hogwarts is fine enough for summer afternoons. But this is a castle in the kingdom of entirely else. It's the first thing Tyler Marshall sees in the morning, the last thing he sees at night. And that's just the way he likes it. Love it. So, yeah, this is great. And I think this goes into exactly what we've been talking about here, Matt, where in a different book, Tyler Marshall is the main character. And like here he is, kid waking up, dreaming of adventure, dreaming of of a fantasy adventure exactly like Jack Hat. The, yeah. the same kind of thing that something is going to happen to him. He's going to be thrust across a threshold into the world of fairy and go on a magical adventure with castles and dragons and unicorns. And it's going to be great. And the book is basically telling us, no, um, actually not. Yeah. 
Right. In, in intentionally stark contrast to the previous story where that's what happened. This is not going to happen this time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Ty, he, we see here is woken up to George Wraithburn, our radio DJ speaking. And I think because for a couple of reasons, because a, we know that this kid is about to be a victim of the fisherman and B in the world of Straub and King, like we've talked about, children always seem to be more important. I think we're paying extra special close attention to everything that happens to Tyler in his morning. Like the book has kind of signaled for us. You should be paying attention to this as well. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I, uh, I do feel like this is, this is this part of the story. We're learning plot detail. We're, we're mm-hmm. learning, we're learning details that are going to be more plot relevant. Um, uh, sure. In, in the, in the immediate term. I love this part as well. Speaking of, of good writing, his dad sometimes asked him why he set his alarm so early. It's summer vacation after all. And Tyler can't seem to make him understand that every day is important, especially those filled with warmth and sunlight and no particular responsibilities. It's as if there's some little voice deep inside him warning him not to waste a minute, not a single one, because time is short. So what, what uh-huh. do you think of that? Um, you know, <laughs> maybe he does have a voice inside him telling him that time is short. Um <laughs> You know, it's funny. I I, 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 I think I'm being overly galaxy brain here, but like, I, I do wonder if Tyler's not gonna be murdered, but but just kidnapped, and then, um, and then the the plot will be like his parents trying to retrieve him from wherever he's taken. Um, it's possible that I'm just being like really optimistic about the direction the story is heading, and I just can't accept that we're gonna go as dark as it kind of <laughs> seems like we're gonna go. Sure. Um, but that like at this point, that kind of seems like a, a possible plot direction. No, I like that. I also, you know, just generally like this idea of it's like, I don't care if it's summer vacation, dad. I un- I understand how precious and wonderful this this special time of my life is. And I can't yeah. I can't even begin to explain that to you because I mean, like to me, like the sleeping until noon thing doesn't really kick into your teenager. Like when you're a young child, like I woke up early during summer vacation because yeah. like the days are long and you want to fill it with as much fun as possible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I was a young teenager, I would wake up early to play EverQuest. So <laughs> that's a little different. <laughs> is it? <laughs> um, I feel like it is. Uh, I don't know. Needed to get those grinding hours in, man. Yeah, man. Got to camp. That's uh... it's what, it's what childhood is all about. <laughs> so Ty, momentarily halts getting ready when George Wraithburn on the, the radio starts talking about the fisherman and here we learn something here that, that you might have already known, Matt, but uh, maybe all of our readers didn't. The fisherman is named after Albert Fish, who is a real, as in real life, as in exists outside the world of the book, serial killer who raped, murdered, and ate at least three children and possibly as many as nine during his run uh, back in the 20s and 30s. He was caught and executed in 1936. So as as Wraithburn points out here, newspaper-friendly you know, moniker aside, this can't be the same person. Um, and this this fact comforts Tyler, but we know that's all for not here. Yeah, it's interesting because if we're in a fantasy world, then like you could they could be insinuating like, well, maybe he is this like maybe he is the same dark entity that 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 inhabited uh, Albert Fish. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but yeah. Um, Did you know about Albert Fish I, before? I. I, I did. Um, Albert Fish is one of those things where you learn about Albert Fish and you're like, hmm, interesting. I guess God can't possibly be real um, <laughs> if this is if this is a thing that's that's real in this world. Um, and and I, I, I although I've like there's a certain fascination to serial killer stuff. For me, it crosses the line into just. um not something I ever want to think about when it's a serial killer who preys on children. Sure. It's, I mean, it's bad enough, just normal serial killers, but like when it's children, I'm just like, Nope. Um, so, so, so that's, uh, maybe this is a, a sore spot of mine. I don't know, but pet peeve, I, what, what's the word? Just a, a personal, um, thing that bothers me, uh, uniquely, um, as somebody who enjoys, um, horrible stuff happening in 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 books. Um, I'm not really amused by the idea of a serial killer that murders children. Um, 
don't like it. It's understandable. And and it is, you know, very interesting that the book has chosen to pull this like straight from the the headlines. I mean, I guess a hundred years later. Um, but like a, a real a real person, right? Yeah. And I mean, we have to say that like we've already said that that our our, our friendly neighborhood journalist Wendell, um, who the book is kind of priming us to not like, even though we haven't met him yet, um, is the one that came up with this. So decided that hey, uh, these crimes are very similar to another another serial killer that existed in a uh, uh, hundred years ago. So why don't I give him the, that name because it'll help sell papers? And so it's almost as if the book is is understanding that your reaction to choosing to dub this this fictional serial killer after a real person is disturbing. And it's saying, yes, I agree. Isn't it fucked up that this character did that? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I think you're right about that. But uh, that is going to be the end of our chapter, because from here we move away from Tyler Marshall and we're told we're going to we're going to go meet the voice of French Landing that we've heard a few times talking about, you know, even a blind man could see that that was a bad play. That's kind of his call sign, I guess. That's that was the that was the joke at the beginning of the podcast, Matt. I don't know if you you got that. I did. I did. And it's interesting. We, we There's a lot of there's a lot to do with vision. We are a floating moat of vision. Sure. Um, um, the text talks about us being blind as pigs uh, or, you know, ignorant as pigs, blind as pigs, something like that. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a lot of seeing and sight and blindness and so forth. Um, we'll, we'll see if that um, image symbol, whatever, um, remains with us as we go forward. Yeah, but we will find out more next week when we when we meet the voice of French Landing with Mr. George Rathburn. Um, and that is that is it for the beginning of the talisman next week we've got two more chapters we're going to cover chapters three and four which will conclude part one of the book um, and move us away from being uh, a leaf on the wind as we fly through french landing all right all right uh no discussion question this week of course because it is our first episode of the book but we will have a discussion question for you next week and Matt, I, I want to do something a little bit different with this one. I, I actually, I really want to know what our listeners think about these first four chapters of Black House, because sure. it's 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 a very divisive opening to a book. Not everyone likes it, and I want to know, listeners, what do you what do you think? What do you think of these chapters? Does the style of writing, the style of narration, does it work for you? And and why or why not? Yeah. So is is that the the question we're asking for? for That is the question. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Does it work for you? Why or why not? Cool. Yeah. What do you think of it? Does it work for you? Why or why not? Yep. All right. That's going to do it for us here this week. As we said, next week, the opening of Black House will continue with chapters three and four of the novel. So make sure you get those read and then join us here at the same time as always, which is for some reason, 4 a.m. on Thursday is when I set the episode to release. (laughs) Don't know why I picked 4 a.m., but here we go. That's because then you can be assured that you'll wake up and it'll be. Um, Yep. (laughs) Remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at KingslingersPod. And of course, the subreddit at r slash doofmedia is another great place to hang out, answer the discussion question, or just uh, post about uh, uh, Stephen King stuff. Or Moon Knight. Or Moon Knight, for that matter. Talk about Moon Knight. Everybody's favorite current thing. It's a terrible show. Um, and uh, if you're already not subscribed, to, I said that sentence wrong. Subscribe to our podcast, please. If you haven't done it, if you made it all the way to the end of this episode and you're not subscribed, that's weird. Please do it. Yeah. You know, we have a YouTube channel. That, I, mean, I mean, we always say that you can go on YouTube, but like maybe people are subscribed to us on the podcatcher and don't know that we have a YouTube channel and then they can yeah. just go subscribe on that as well and then never miss anything ever from any. And- yeah. And apparently Twitch, uh, the the video game streaming platform, is changing how they're going to do streaming. Um, and it's pissing a lot of content creators off. So we're all moving to YouTube live streaming now, Matt. That's what we're doing. We're all doing it. So okay. subscribe to our YouTube and you'll see me play video games, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe, maybe me too, eventually, possibly. <laughs> it's a lot of clarifiers on that. <laughs> all right. Uh, if you like our show and you want to support us, then please consider donating to patreon.com slash doof media. Special thanks this week to new patrons, Brett N, Mad Sprayer, Roman and Craig C. 
welcome all of you. We hope you enjoy the cool stuff we have over there on the Patreon, uh, including our bonus podcast where we talk about adaptations of Stephen King's stories. I believe this month, this coming month, we're going to be talking about... Um, I blanked on the name of it, but I know what it is in my head. I, I'm Gerald's waiting game. to see if... There you go. Gerald's you did game. it. <laughs> Gerald's game. Yes. Yes, we will be doing that. And this week, you just released your contribution to the bonus contest where you meet with your brother and talk about random stuff for a couple hours. That's Freeman Bros. It's one of our four bonus podcasts we release every month on the Patreon. Uh, I listened to that today, Matt, and it was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. Although every single time you and your brother talk about video games, I get annoyed because it's like, here's what happens. Daniel says, blah, 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 terrible game design example. And you're like, wow, that sounds great. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's it's because my I was broken by EverQuest when I was young and, and I just I've just remained broken still. Yeah, it sounds so great that nothing in the game tells you what you need to do to solve a quest and you have to go to the Internet to learn how to actually play the game. That's so much great. better that way. I love it's, it. It's, it's great. I'm, it's great design. It's genius. <laughs> But of course, if you cannot afford to donate to us, uh, that is absolutely okay. This podcast will always be absolutely free, and you can listen to it to your heart's content, and you can share it. That is a great way to help us out, and it doesn't cost you a dime. Please continue to share the podcast, and of course, please continue to leave us rating and reviews. Last week, Matt, we extended a challenge to our listeners because we were out of reviews to read, and we said, we said if we didn't get a new one, I was going to light a copy of Cujo on fire symbolically representing the fact that you will never be allowed to read that book ever for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, and, and Matt, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, it was not looking good. Uh -huh. We were moving into the <laughs> our recording time. Every minute was going by and I'm like, uh Oh, uh Oh. And oh, I looked no. at my copy of Cujo sitting on my shelf and it was going, uh Oh, <laughs> uh, and then <laughs> in the last minute, someone sent in a new review and saved your experience with Cujo. Thank it's, God. Yeah, I know. I know you were really, uh, you were really looking forward to reading that book, and it just it was so close, so close mm -hmm. to never getting to know what happens with that big rabies dog. Yeah, totally, man. But this week's heroic spotlight review comes from. So I think, I think they just wanted to write the name Bob like a bunch of times, uh -huh. but they missed some bees. So it actually says. Bobo Boo Bob Boo Bobob. Uh huh. Who gives us five stars and says, perfect tower companion and so much more. Like previous reviewer Stupid Tom, I'm late to the Kingslinger party, but so glad I found it. I'm a constant reader, but I'm only on my second reread of the Dark Tower series. Having Scott and Matt along for the journey has given me so much joy, insight, and context for the broader Towerverse. I genuinely feel anticipation to find out how Matt is going to feel about a particular development or plot twist, and Scott's takes always demonstrate a deep understanding of King's work. Imagine my delight when I realize there's a second current season with all kinds of delights and adjacencies, including my personal favorite of all time the stand there's so much value in the dark tower episodes themselves and so much more to look forward to i would unequivocally unequivocally recommend kingslingers as a companion to your enrich to to your to writ uh, to enrich your reading experience ah oh, wow thank you so much ba 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 boo ba 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 really appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> that that, that that just makes me feel so happy. Thank you. And, and here's the fascinating thing about this review, Matt. I don't know if Bobo Boo Bob 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 uh -huh. uh, was aware of the 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 danger to Cujo when they wrote this review. It sounds like they're not quite caught up with season two. So there's a good chance it's just like an angel descending from on high to deliver Cujo into your loving arms. I mean, you know what you know what I'm gonna say, Scott. What? Ka. <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, Matt, that was the only review we got in the past week. Oh. So we got a couple ratings, but no more reviews. So Cujo, once again on the chopping block, be like <laughs> everyone, be like Bobo, Boo, Bob, 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 Bam, um, and save Cujo because Matt really wants to read it. I don't actually know when Matt's going to read Cujo. I just picked a book, uh, and I'm I'm not actually going to burn a book. By the way, I was just kidding. But I I am serious that Matt, you will never be allowed to read this book. Never. Okay, yeah. and if I find out, I found out you did. I'm gonna burn something else. Well, 
you know what? Let's let's do a whole like let's make if if they if they fail us, Scott, you we'll just have to make a YouTube video where you will actually burn a copy of Cujo. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to burn a book. Get a really nice Criterion Collection copy of Cujo. <laughs> don't make me do this. All yeah. you have to do, yeah, listeners, don't make us do this. Is click the five stars and then write good exclamation point. That's it. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Yeah. I also have to say that um, one of the flaws of Apple Podcasts is that there exist other countries besides America, and uh, us in America are not able to see the reviews left in other countries. So if you live in Canada or Australia or one of the many countries around the world and are leaving me reviews and are like, why is he talking about how he doesn't have any reviews when he hasn't read mine? It's because I can't see it. And we used to have a service that would do that for us that would would go out to Apple Podcasts Canada and find them for us and present them to us. But then one day they said, hey, uh, we've decided to charge money for this. Uh (laughs) And I said, oh, okay, no. (laughs) You know what? If if you did leave a review on on one of those things, then like take a screenshot and email it to us and then we'll read it. Yeah. That's a good idea. Do yeah. that. Take a screenshot, email it to us, kingslingerspod at gmail.com, and we will uh, we will read those and save Matt's Cujo experience. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you again, Bob, 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 Bob uh, for those kind words. We really do appreciate that. And yes, I am very much also looking forward to covering the stand. Uh, we just have this 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 whole big book to get through first, but yep. it's it's exciting. These next few months are going to be really great. So um, thank you. And thank you to everyone who leaves those reviews. And that is going to do it for us this week. We will see you back here next week for the next two chapters of Black House. Maybe we'll figure out a little bit more about what the heck is going on on this book, Matt. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. 